a home for the homeless, and a dream many years in the making. There were many nights where halfway through this project, I'd wake up in the middle of the night thinking, what have I done? Plus, I do not normally ride the roller coaster. And there's a good reason why. The pain was sharp, so tight, I could barely move it. Now watch her get a double blessing. Jesus healed my arm that day, too. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. The Democratic convention in Philadelphia was supposed to be a coronation for Hil Hillary Clinton. She's the first woman ever nominated for president by a major party. Instead, the Democrats are embroiled once again in a controversy over emails. Those leaked emails show that the party leadership was favoring Clinton over her opponent, Socialist Senator Bernie Sanders. And now the head of the National or the Democratic National Committee is resigning. We have two reports for you from Philadelphia, beginning with David Brody. Well, welcome everybody to the city of brotherly love, but make no mistake, the love isn't exactly flowing among the thousands of delegates that have gathered here at the Wells Fargo Arena. The Bernie Sanders folks are fired up and ready to go. They see Hillary Clinton as too establishment and cozy with Wall Street. Now they have fresh ammunition, thousands of leaked emails that show a supposedly impartial Democrat National Committee working to secure the nomination for Hillary Clinton, even trying to paint the Jewish Sanders as an atheist to voters in the South. I uh, think the Clinton people stole it. I uh, think the correct... Uh, Corruption is starting to become more publicly known with the WikiLeaks and such. The head of the DNC, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, will resign after the convention. That doesn't mean the end of the disunity problems, however. Liberals, unhappy with VP selection Tim Kaine, are looking to cause a stir. Uh, there's talk about walking out of the vice presidential or presidential acceptance speech. Uh, there's talk about uh, total silence, uh, remaining seated. Uh, turning backs. Even with this drama, the reality is Clinton will be the nominee. She then faces the challenge of reaching out to disgruntled progressives while striking a more moderate tone for the general election. It has been the, the Democratic Party's history that once the nominee uh, is established and we know who that's going to be, that we rally the troops and folks tend to come inside the tent. Of course, there are always those who were not coming in the tent and they never were going to be in the tent, and that's okay. All eyes will be on Bernie Sanders as he gets set to make a huge, big speech to the delegates here Monday night. Speaking of big speeches, vice presidential nominee Tim Kaine set to deliver the biggest speech of his career. More on that from CBN's Jennifer Wishon here with us in Philadelphia. Jennifer. David Kane has a lot of work to do introducing himself to Democrats. Liberals aren't happy with him. Conservatives think he's too liberal which leads many Democrats to believe he's just right. The reality about Tim Kaine is once people get to know him, they tend to like him, even if they disagree with him. And he's never lost an election. I am so excited. I've known Tim Kaine for many years. He is my senator and governor. I live in the state of Virginia. And so I know his heart, I know his commitment. Coming off one of the biggest days of his life, Senator Kane walked through his Richmond neighborhood with his wife Ann to St. Elizabeth Catholic Church. It's where the couple has worshiped for three decades. Inside, Kane got emotional at times and even sang a solo in the choir. Although he has worked to reduce abortions, he's come under fire for his support of pro-life policies. But here at the Democratic National Convention, his position is just right. He's a, a committed Catholic, a social justice Catholic. He takes that very seriously in the work that he does in the world and his work in politics is part of his outreach. Praise the Lord, everybody. Hallelujah. Let's lift him up in this place today. Several hundred Democrats followed Kane's example, gathering here in Philadelphia at an interfaith service Sunday. We in trouble, but it would not matter. I'm going to praise you anyhow. And I said, listen, Lord, I, I praise you in the morning. Oh, I praise you all day long. And even when I go to sleep, 
My heart keeps singing this song. I praise you. Reverend Forbes says this week, Americans will see a vastly different vision for the future. I would wish that the world gets the chance to see two major options. An option that they remember for people who are angry, who are afraid, versus a group that's willing to risk possibilities that we could probably do it together but that the prospect of our working together is even brighter. So far, it's been a mixed bag, but the week is young. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News at the Democratic National Convention in Philadelphia. Uh, it may be a very tumultuous convention, and we'll see how that develops. But one of the things coming out of this WikiLeaks uh, scandal for the Democratic Party is not just uh, the co collusion against one of the candidates running for the nomination. It's the collusion with news media. And I hope that doesn't get lost in this, that uh, CBS News poll, that the talking points for that, the headlines in that uh, poll report were discussed with the DNC. And then Politico reporters giving, uh, a Politico reporter giving his story in advance to the DNC before he even gives it to his own editor. Uh, so when, when you start looking at, do we really have free elections? Uh, do we really have a free and open news media? Can we trust what we see in mainstream news? Uh, you, you've got to start looking at these emails and going, is there a much larger story here? Uh, more than just Bernie Sanders, but is it really an open process? Then take it back to what the IRS did to the Tea Parties, uh, the various committees, uh, and refused to allow them to register, refused for there to be a grassroots uh, organization saying we're spending too much money, our deficit's out of control, and in that refusal denied them a voice in the last election cycle. Uh, is this a much broader situation where those in power want to protect that power and will do anything against outsiders? That's a story that we need to cover. Well, we're going to be covering the Democratic Convention all this week, so stay tuned. We'll be there uh, for you and reporting on what happens in that convention. In other news, uh, once again, a deadly shooting at a nightclub in Florida. Ephraim Graham has that story from the CBN Newsroom. Ephraim? Gordon, police in Fort Myers, Florida report at least two people are dead and 16 wounded in that shooting. The attack apparently occurred at a teen party. The injuries range from minor to life-threatening. At least three people have been detained and police are looking for others who may have been involved. It wasn't clear early in the investigation what triggered the violence. Another attack in Germany last night, a Syrian man set off a bomb outside a music festival, killing himself and wounding a dozen others. A recent series of deadly attacks by migrants has created a climate of fear in Germany and shed a spotlight on the nation's immigration policy. De Hurd is on this story. Germany has been shaken by the fourth attack in a week, this time an apparent suicide bombing near a music festival that injured 12 people. Three of the four recent attacks were by immigrants. In the latest attack, police in Ansbach say a 27-year-old Syrian who had been denied asylum blew himself up at a bar. It's being investigated as terrorism. The violence has even more Germans questioning Chancellor Angela Merkel's refugee program that has opened Germany's doors to more than a million migrants from the Muslim world. The weekend began with Friday's shooting in Munich that killed 10 people, including the gunman, an 18-year-old Iranian German with a history of mental illness. It happened while police were still investigating last week's axe and knife attack on a Bavarian train by a young Afghan refugee that injured five people too critically. Sunday night, a woman was killed and two other people were injured after they were attacked by a 21-year-old Syrian asylum seeker wielding a machete. And panic broke out on a regional train Saturday when a 22-year-old man, apparently German, threatened passengers with a knife. This is a new era for Germany, a much more violent one. Dale Hurd, CBN News. 
A Christian baker in Colorado is asking the Supreme Court to hear his case after a lower court ruled he can't refuse to bake cakes for gay weddings. Jack Phillips is the owner of Masterpiece Cake Shop in Colorado. He refused to bake a wedding cake for a gay couple because he says it violated his religious beliefs. But a federal court ruled he could not cite his faith as a reason to decline baking the cake. The Denver Post reported his attorney filed a petition to the Supreme Court Friday, saying no one should be forced to further a message they can't in good conscience promote. Phillips wrote an opinion piece for the Post on why he's asking the Supreme Court to protect his artistic freedom. You can find a link to that at CBNNews.com. Gordon. Well, I actually think this is the wrong case to take to the Supreme Court. This one conjures up images of lunch counters being segregated in the South back in the Civil Rights Movement. And, and I, ju I just think you're going to have an uphill battle. The better case for the Supreme Court to look at is the recent ruling by a U.S. District Court judge regarding the law passed in Mississippi about freedom of conscience. Uh, that one, I think, is very important and one that needs to be heard. What it's saying is that if you're an elected official and you do not wish to uh, participate in things that violate your religious belief, uh, all you have to do is find somebody else to substitute for you. Uh, that's an important one, and that one allows Christians of faith to participate in the public square uh, without having to worry about, am I mandated to officiate at a gay wedding? Am I mandated to do something that would violate my conscience and violate my religious rights? Uh, that's one that needs to be heard, because if we don't have that, then where is freedom of conscience? Where is freedom of religion in America? That's the one that needs to be taken up on appeal. Terry? Well, coming up, meet a homeless family who found a place of refuge. We were living in a hotel before here. It was a matter of a week. We were going to be in our van. We were able to move in here and have a roof over our head. Stay tuned for a tour of the River of Refuge and see how a vacant hospital has been transformed into housing for the homeless after this. It was once a hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Now it's a home to families who used to live in pay-by-the-week motels. It's also, also the vision of a pastor who wanted to show love to his community in a very tangible way. Charlene Aaron brings us uh, this story. She brought it to us first six years ago when the ministry got its start, and then she went back to Kansas City for this update on the River of Refuge. Mario Glenn is enjoying raising his seven children from the comfort of his new four-bedroom apartment. A big change from where the single dad and his kids once lived after losing their home. We ended up moving with a friend um, in a one-bedroom apartment. Mario's family is one of several that live here at the River of Refuge. I'm actually standing in one of the apartments here. It's all part of a vision to help the city's homeless have a safe, and comfortable place to call home. Pastor John Wiley is the motivating force behind the program. In 2009, he told CBN News of his dream to turn the vacant Park Lane Hospital into transitional housing for the homeless. It's a place of refuge where they can get healed with dignity and move out with their own money. That dream recently became a reality when the first families moved in. Well, it feels great. It's surreal. You know, seven years of believing that this was possible. We've helped hundreds and hundreds of families over seven years, but we couldn't bring them here and give them a transitional place, but now we can. So here we are in a former 150,000 square foot hospital dedicated to families that are living in homelessness. Wiley says the journey has been long and hard, but worth it. There were many nights where halfway through this project, I'd wake up in the middle of the night thinking, what have I done? Because we had so many obstacles that seemed to be in the way. But over seven years, I've watched obstacle after obstacle become removed. And so what it's done for me personally, it's changed my faith. And love compelled me to not walk away, and to not give up, and to persevere. Families here live rent and utility free, 
during their entire stay as a team of caseworkers provide them financial counseling. While learning to break the cycle of homelessness, they can also save money and pay off debts. An on-site pantry allows families to restock their kitchens with non-perishable food, and there's a used clothing store where they can shop for clothing. Program director Stephanie Keck says rising unemployment and utility costs have forced many families out of their homes, creating demand for programs like this. The first 24 hours, I had close to 30 people calling for help just in that first 24 hours. And we still get, on average, probably 20 people a week asking for help. This morning, uh, I had six calls for people asking, can I apply for your program? Michelle Robinson moved here from Florida with her husband and two small children. Soon after arriving, her husband's job fell through, and River of Refuge gave them a lifeline. We were living in a hotel before here. And the length of time just drained our savings, and it was a matter of a week we were going to be in our van. So it was by the grace of God that I found this place, and we were able to move in here and have a roof over our head. Mario admits that he initially felt skeptical about the organization. I didn't even believe it was real. I, I, when I got in here, I was here sitting around waiting on, like, okay, what's the catch? <laughs> It's always a catch, but it wasn't a catch here. They just generally want to see people do better. For that, his children are beyond grateful. Most of all, it's not a lot of weight on my daddy because when we we had to keep moving around and he had to pay the rent, and now here you don't have to pay rent, but you have to save up money for uh, your next house. Not even enough for breath in my body how many thank you they deserve for what they have helped us with and done for us. Wiley makes it clear he didn't do this alone. So much has happened where I had the idea of doing this, but really it's not about me, it's about all the people that have donated and believed in it. We had one company donate $1.2 million for a new roof. All the materials, all the labor. Another company came and did $300,000 to build out the 11 units. The UMKC, uh, University of Kansas City, Missouri, gave us over 200 oak bunk beds donated the first week we opened the hospital. CBN also played a huge role. When CBN's Gordon Robertson saw Wiley's story on the 700 Club, he invited him to CBN to learn more about the project. Wiley left with encouragement and the largest donation River of Refuge had received at that time. That gift that CBN gave grew and grew and grew, and it's grown to be worth millions now of other contributions. And I think about the families that are living here now, the hundreds of children, and the families that will come here for decades to come will all be touched because of the generosity of CBN and its donors. For now, 11 apartment units are complete, and River of Refuge needs more financial help before it can bring in more families. Meanwhile, Wiley shares this encouragement for pastors across the country. You don't need a lot of money or a big building. What you have is the most incredible gift. Love attracts a crowd. Love is the most compelling force. There are motel families in every city, in every municipality, and I challenge my friends who love Jesus, go find a motel family and don't try to fix all their problems. Just become their friends. Ask them what they need. Open your, open your living room. Open your checkbook. And love the people you see. Charlene Aaron, CBN News, Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, those are wonderful words from John Wiley. I just I love him. I think he's doing a wonderful thing. And just think about your own city, uh, where you live. Uh, all you have to do is go buy some of those, you know, motels. You see them advertising. You can rent by the week. Uh, when you see that, I guarantee you're going to find a family there. Uh, that's in need. So extend love to them. And a big thank you to the 700 Club Partners because you're part of that. That's uh, part of the legacy of your giving is it enables us to help ministries just like John Wiley's. So if you're not a member, want to join with us, all you have to do is call us. 1-800-759-0700. And we have an update on since Charlene filed her report. Michelle Robinson and her family have completed the program and they're now living 
in their own apartment, and that is absolutely wonderful, giving people hope, giving them dignity to let them know in their downtimes, we're there, we're there for them, we're not to give them a handout, we want to give them a hand up to show them that God loves them and we love them too. I think that crayon children's writing at the end says it all, I feel wanted and secure what every child and family ought to feel. Well, up next, a mom grants her son his graduation wish when she takes a roller coaster ride. I do not normally ride the roller coasters. It was very scary, and I think because I wasn't used to it, I was just very tense. See how she lived to regret that ride when we come back. To see this week's top on-demand videos, go to CBN.com. Bren Border was looking forward to being part of our live 700 Club audience during her summer vacation. But before her family came to Virginia Beach, they traveled to Williamsburg to do something Bren was not looking forward to, riding a roller coaster. Bren Border and her homeschooling family were vacationing in coastal Virginia, just as they do every June. On the first day of their trip, they went to Busch Gardens theme park and headed straight for the roller coaster. I do not normally ride the roller coasters. In fact, our oldest son, Robert, for his senior year graduation, he said, Mom, you cannot. I'm graduating. You have to go on the roller coaster, please. And I, that's why I did. It was very scary, and I think because I wasn't used to it, I was just very tense. Bren was shaken up by the impact of the ride, but otherwise felt fine. It wasn't until late that night that she began to experience intense pain in her arm. The pain worsened the next morning. The pain was sharp, so tight that I could barely move it. The only way that the pain would subside a little is holding it as tight to my chest as I could. Bren and her family prayed for a healing. A few times a day, she forced herself to extend her arm. I just felt that I had to do that. I guess it was instinct that it felt like it was freezing. I thought the more that I moved it, maybe I would be able to loosen it up, but I was not able to do that. Bren took Tylenol to help manage the pain. She didn't want to interrupt their vacation with a doctor visit, so she decided to tough it out. As the week went on, I did get more and more frightened because the pain was worse. I think the pain was getting worse because I was forced to hold it in one position all week, and therefore the pain would travel up to my arm, shoulder, neck. Later that week, the family went to a taping of the 700 Club. Bren had the opportunity to meet the host and share her testimony. I do remember saying to Gordon that I rededicated my life to the Lord at 20 by watching the 700 Club, and it was through one of his prayers, a sinner's prayer that he led on TV, and I thanked him for that. It was amazing to be on the set to see where everything happens that I've been watching for so long. During the taping, Gordon and Terry led a time of prayer. Someone else with an injury on your right arm and it's both the elbow and the shoulder and God's restoring, no more pain, begin to move that arm and realize the great miracle that just happened. He's able to restore. He's able to reattach tendons. He's able to do all these things because he loves you, he cherishes you. I honestly thought, well, oh my gosh, that's me. That is exactly what happened to me. I just took it and said, Lord, I thank you that my arm is healed and I believe that that prayer is for me and I accept it in Jesus' name. After the taping, the group took a tour of CBN. We were walking up the steps and I noticed that I was not struggling as much as I was earlier in the week when I had to walk up steps. So what I would do is just move it very slowly, the way that I was trying to do throughout the week, and it wasn't as hard. It was much freer. At that point, when I was able to move it, it barely hurt at all. And by the time I went up to my husband and my mom to tell them that the pain was gone, it was totally gone. It was 
totally normal again as if it, was, it had never happened. Bren has been pain-free ever since and has full mobility of her arm. She says that the healing was a reminder of God's promises. My family learned by seeing it happen to me that God does answer prayer. And I'm, I'm so glad that we visited the 700 Club that day, not even knowing or thinking that a healing would take place. Just excited to come. But we got doubly blessed, not only by being here in the audience, but Jesus healed my arm that day too. We bring you these reports because we want you to hear what God is doing in the lives of others. And because he's no respecter of persons, what he did for Bren, he is willing and able to do for you today as well. We want to take some time to pray for you, whatever your needs might be, and to further build your faith by sharing even more stories. This is Tommy from Deshard, Tennessee, fell getting out of his bathtub, ruptured four discs in his back, causing pressure on his sciatic nerve. Surgery was not advised. His doctors placed him on pain pills, which gave him no relief. One day he's watching this program and Gordon, you said this, there's someone you're laying your hand on the back of your neck. God has just done a mighty miracle for you. He's put all the vertebrae back into place. He's put all the discs back into place. Everything is normal. Those muscles are relaxing now in Jesus name. That pain just left you. What you couldn't do before, turn to the left and realize God has healed you. Turn to the right, take your head back, take it to your chest and realize you are completely healed and set free. God wants you to know this pain will never return. In Jesus name, you're healed. Tommy knew immediately that God had healed his back. He remains pain free to this okay. day. Wow. Yeah. That's, That's wonderful. Well, here's one. Diane from Atlanta. I didn't know there was an Atlanta, Michigan. She had sickness, neck pain for two months beginning in April. She had trouble swallowing due to a lump in her throat that created a great deal of suffering for her, made it even difficult to breathe. Her neck began to swell. The pain was excruciating. Then, June 16, she was watching the 700 Club. Terry said this, someone you have a, a kind of an obstruction in your throat. God's healing that for you right now. It's gone. In Jesus' name, well, after praying, Diane received complete healing that same day. First, she noticed she was able to swallow. Then the pain went away, and the lump disappeared entirely. That's wonderful. God loves you. He loves you. And when you get that settled, when you get it set in your heart that God himself is love, just get that settled. He's love. He loves you. He loves you so much he died for you. And by his stripes, you were healed. You are healed. You get to walk free from that. You don't have to live in guilt and shame. You don't have to wonder is somehow this is God's will for you to suffer. You don't have to wonder any of that. He loves you. He wants to set you free. He's your loving heavenly father. And which one of us, if we had children, they were sick, what would we do? We would do everything possible to bring them into health, bring them into joy. And our loving heavenly father wants even more than that. He loves you infinitely. Now just believe that. The Bible says, these signs shall follow them that believe. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Now, Terry and I are going to agree. We've got a wonderful studio audience with us today, just like in that story you just saw. They're all wrapped up in blankets because we keep it very cold in here. But they're going to pray. Despite it's cold, it's gonna, they're going to pray with us. And we're going to believe. So in an act of faith, lay your hand on that area of the body that needs healing. And Terry and I are going to agree. The studio audience is going to agree. The viewing audience is going to agree. And we're all going to join in prayer just for you. And let Daddy, Abba Father, come to you and heal you. Let's pray. Lord, we lift the needs of the audience to you. And we just declare your name. Your name is love. Your name is faithfulness. Your name is healer. And so we declare that 
over anyone who is suffering right now. And as an act of faith, as they lay hands on that area of the body that needs healing, we just come into agreement with them and we join together and we say out loud, be healed and be made whole in the name of Jesus. There's a man named Frank and you're sitting in, in a chair. And you've got terrible pain in the middle of your back and you actually thought to yourself, I can't possibly lay hands on this. And Jesus has heard your prayer. He's heard your, your cry. And right now, your back is being restored. What the doctors say would never happen, that it's impossible. With God, all things are possible. And so you're f literally feeling your back come together again. You're literally sensing bone being strengthened and renewed now in Jesus name. And that area of pain is just huge pain just left you now in Jesus name. Be healed, Frank, and be restored. Terry? There's someone you have had liver damage. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what the cause of it was, mm -hmm. but um, the jury's still out on whether that's going to heal for you or not. God's healing it for you right now. It's gone in Jesus name. Just receive wellness. Someone with problems in, in your right shoulder. It's both a I'm um, hearing the words uh, scapula and, and labrum. And God is able to restore. He's able to heal. And, and again, what doctors say is impossible, that cartilage never heals. In Jesus' name, he heals that. He restores that. He's able to put it all back together. And so right now, do what you couldn't do before. If you couldn't move that right arm, move it now. If you couldn't uh, reach up with it, do it now. Realize God has healed you. He's restored it now in Jesus' name. Someone else with chronic fibromyalgia, you've had it mm -hmm. for a while. You just kind of accept it as your lot in life. God's healing you right now. Just lift up your hands and receive it. Your energy's returning as you stretch your muscles and your joints. No more pain. You are made whole in Jesus' name. Suff someone suffering, the ophthalmologist is called a dry eye. And God is able to heal that and restore that right now. He's able to do whatever is needed to be done in your eyelids to restore the proper oils and lubrication. In Jesus' name, be healed. Someone else with problems in your right ear um, and recurring deep infections, um, discharges out of that ear. God's able to heal it and make it so it never comes back again. You're restored now in Jesus' name and esophagus issues restored now in Jesus' name, completely whole. Lord, we thank you, for you are the healer. We receive it now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you have a report of a miracle in your life, we want to share your story uh, with the world. We want to tell people what God is doing in the world today. So if that's you, give us a call, 1-800-759-0700. And if you need prayer, we believe in prevailing pr prayer. That's the prayer that gets an answer because you know God wants to do it. All you have to do is break through in prayer. So if you need someone to stand with you in prayer, we're here. All you have to do is call us 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 1-800-759-0700. There. Well, coming up later, a look at 20 years of ministry, humanitarian aid, miracles, and much, much more. The story of Operation Blessing Philippines is still ahead. And welcome back to the 700 Club. A federal judge ruled that forcing insurers to include birth control coverage against their religious convictions is unconstitutional. Missouri Senator Paul Whelan and his wife filed a lawsuit arguing being forced to pay for birth control coverage in their state health insurance plan violates their Catholic faith. The lawsuit addresses a section of Obamacare that requires insurers to pay for birth control. The judge ruled the birth control mandate is a unique burden on their religious freedom. CBN relief teams are still helping people in the country of Nepal recover from a devastating earthquake more than a year ago. The 7.4 magnitude quake destroyed more than half a million homes. Now people there are being trained on how to create their own homes from scratch. 
This month, CBN purchased bricks to begin training the Nepalese on how to build their own homes. The plans are to get the materials that are needed and to get them started to rebuild. The project was a joint effort of CBN's humanitarian and disaster relief teams and CBN donors. You can always learn more about what CBN is doing around the world by logging on to CBN.com slash international. We're in Ontario right back with more of the 700 Club after this. Well, 20 years ago, Operation Blessing Philippines started with two people in a room asking one question. How can we do good for people? Well, this is the amazing story of God's ongoing answer to that question. I'm standing in Piatas. On July 10th, the mountain of trash behind me literally blew up and then buried the shanty town to my right, killing 209 people. It was July 1997. Operation Blessing Philippines was a year old. Founder Gordon Robertson just launched a feeding program for undernourished children living in Manila's biggest dump site. A few weeks later, heavy rains there caused a massive landslide. What triggered the activity was a desire on the part of Oper Operation Blessing in the United States uh, to do a feeding program uh, to the trash picker community in Piatas. And so when the landslide came, we were there. Uh, and, and that started a whole ministry to that community. And as I'm standing giving food to people in desperate need, the question came to me, well, what happens in two weeks? This food's going to run out in two weeks, and these people are still going to be here on this trash dump. Uh, and I had to do something about that. Since it was founded in 1996, Operation Blessing Philippines had been bringing short-term medical missions to remote parts of the country. With the help of volunteer medical teams, we'd reached thousands of Filipinos who had no access to doctors or hospitals. Now a year later, we had another vision, to transform disadvantaged families and communities. That started a whole Piatas program where we started feeding malnourished children. We adopted their families, not just the children, but the whole family. And how do we teach livelihood to the parents? How do we teach proper nutrition, proper sanitation? How do we get rid of the intestinal worms? How do we bring them back into health? Make sure the children can go to school because that's the key uh, long-term generationally for them to advance. And how do we teach the parents how to earn a living so they don't have to pick trash anymore? And we did that successfully with the first group. And then to my absolute amazement, the graduates of the first group said, we want to help. We want to train the next group. And so that's how it just started, and it's, it just became a great joy. While the Payatas Community Program was underway, Operation Blessing Philippines was also helping rebuild lives destroyed by another tragedy several months earlier. March 18, 1996 holds a dreadful memory for the families of the more than 200 young people celebrating graduation day at the now infamous Ozone Disco. The majority of them perished in the most tragic fire disaster of the decade. The 95 survivors now have burn scars to remind them of the catastrophe. At the time of the ozone disco fire, um, we didn't have much money. We, we didn't have uh, many personnel. I, I think our total staff at that point was three people. And I was praying and got this verse, what does God require of you? And it was to, to act justly to love mercy and to walk humbly before him. For me, I had to do something. I had to extend mercy to these survivors. So we took a step of faith and made arrangements to bring in a team of plastic surgeons from the US. God came through. He kept providing, kept providing, kept providing. And the results were thrilling, where people got the use of their hands back. Some got brand new ears where the surgeons brought in this wonderful material that skin would grow over, and they literally sculpted ears for them again. Uh, so it was tremendous. It was a great thrill. It was a great struggle while it was going on, uh, but the results were wonderful. In December 1997, Operation Blessing Philippines and a team of volunteer doctors began reaching out to other nations in Asia. The first foreign medical mission that we did 
with Operation Blessing Philippines was to Shaman, China. And we went into a three self church in Shaman and absolutely wonderful things happened. And we started seeing miracles happen in the medical tent where Christian doctors were praying for their patients and seeing miracles. One of the doctors had actually prayed, Lord, I've never seen a miracle. Could I see one on this trip? And so that was the very first one. And that really inspired us that we could do this and we could do this uh, internationally. Uh, and then when the flying hospital went to Hyderabad, India, it just became natural that a Philippine team would come alongside as well. In the years that followed, Operation Blessing Philippines went on medical missions to Taiwan, Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia, and Afghanistan. It was the model that was followed for OB Indonesia, OB India, OB Thailand, OB Hong Kong, OB China. All of them were modeled on what happened here and the experience that we learned here. Over the past 20 years, Operation Blessing Philippines has partnered with the local government, NGOs, and churches to help roughly 800 children go to school and more than 1,000 people learn a trade. Nearly 3,000 children get good meals now, and we've helped more than 4,000 families start businesses. We've built more than 300 houses, three learning centers, and almost 30 classrooms. We've dug water wells for almost 1,000 families, given more than 6,000 people mobility, and provided surgery for nearly 3,000 people. In total, we've treated more than 800,000 people through our medical missions in hard-to-reach areas and extended aid to more than 2 million survivors of natural disasters. Four separate times, Operation Blessing Philippines has received the NGO of the Year Award from the Armed Forces of the Philippines. Wherever we go, we bring the message of the gospel. I believe in the gospel. I believe it transforms people that you can take care of the material needs, but if you haven't taken care of the spiritual needs, you haven't really done anything for them. And it's the two working together where you have life transformation, where you have that hand up, you have that hope and a future. We're here with Dolores. Dolores is 68 years old, and last month she suffered a stroke and lost the use of her left side, and she's been bedridden ever since. Today we're giving Dolores a wheelchair. But we're also supplying her with goods for her Sorry Sorry store. It's a small general store. And now we want to do something even more. We want to pray for Dolores that God would come and heal her and set her free from this stroke. And so we prayed for her. And then let's say, can you get up? So she stood up and then she started to walk. And then we got her to walk from one point to another. And then it dawned on her, I'm walking. I haven't been able to do this in a long time. I'm walking and the joy in her face and the joy all around us. That was a moment, that was a wonderful moment. In June 2016, Operation Blessing Philippines celebrated its 20th anniversary. The highlight of this milestone event was our most ambitious program yet, the Community of Hope in Tacloban City. It's a brand new community built for more than 300 families whose homes were destroyed in 2013 by a typhoon. Operation Blessing Philippines was on the ground within 24 hours, giving much needed food, water, temporary housing, medical care to people in desperate need. But it didn't stop there. And here we are two and a half years later. And Operation Blessing is still on the ground working and trying to provide homes for people in need. And we're on our way to completing a whole village of brand new homes, that will be typhoon resistant, and I couldn't be prouder of what they've done. Dr. Kim Pasquale, head of Operation Blessing Philippines, says the driving force behind our first 20 years of transforming lives will continue to propel us into the decades ahead. It's the passion to love God, to serve God, and to help people. If we can create different communities of hope, we will be able to change the country. And one of these days, the whole country is a community of hope. And that's been the story of Operation Blessing Philippines. We started very small, very humbly. Um, you know, just two people in a, in a room saying, how can we do good for people? It's grown into this tremendous thing. And now you look at the ability to actually rebuild communities. Over the next 20 years, what can happen? 
And how can we say we can believe God for even more? And what more things can we do? Wow, that brings tears to my eyes, just the, the thinking back 20 years ago and how it started. And a big thank you to all the members of the 700 Club, because without you, that 20-year story wouldn't have happened. Yes, we had very small, very humble beginnings, and it's good to think, okay, what can God do over the next 20 years? But a thank you to you. If you've been a member of the 700 Club, you're part of that. Uh, you have an inheritance in that. If you're not a member want to join with us, all you have to do is pick up a phone and call us. 1-800-759-0700. Just say, yes, I want to be a part of it. I want to be a part of everything you're doing around the world. A portion of every gift goes into the work of Operation Blessing, and it's that long-term support that allows us to build these wonderful organizations where we train Christians how to help people and do it very tangibly. And again, not a handout, but a hand up. How can we give them a hope and a future? And most importantly, how can we bring the gospel to them? If you want to be a part of it, it's just $20 a month. That breaks out to 65 cents a day. So call us, 1-800-759-0700. When you call and join, I want you to have this. It's my father's uh, latest teaching. It's Victory Through Life Storms. And it's his life experience over 86 years, his birthing of CBN, the ups and downs uh, of that whole journey. Uh, we're getting ready to celebrate 55 years on television uh, this fall. And, and he's got a lot of lessons on how to walk with God. So if you want that, join the 700 Club. 1-800-759-0700. Well, up next, we're going to bring it on with your email. Uh, all of that right after this. Bring it on with your email questions. And Gordon, this first one comes from Esmeralda, who says, I've been watching the 700 Club for a week now and heard several testimonies. How do people, quote, claim the word of knowledge, and what does that mean? Uh, Esmeralda, I remember your name because I spoke your name during a prayer. And so I'm, I imagine you're wondering, what, is it, what does it mean for me? Words get quickened, and that's a um, strange English word, quickened. Uh, it refers to when a mother first feels a baby uh, in her womb. Uh, when you first have that first kick and you go, it, the baby has been quickened. Uh, and that's what, what it means to claim a word of knowledge. When you know that you know that you know that it's for you, that God is speaking directly to you, that he cares about you, and he cares so much he's willing to describe what's going on all of that is to encourage your faith to believe and to believe, yes, it's for you. That's what claiming a word is. Yes, it's for me. I believe it. I receive it. And it's happening in my body. What is being described is happening to me. This one is from a viewer who says, I know that the unforgivable sins about denying the Holy Spirit. I was given the gift of prophecy in 2012. At least that's when I realized I had it. Then I said to myself and Jesus, I didn't know if I wanted it. <laughs> After I said that, I no longer had the gift. I was so afraid that the Holy Spirit had left me. I got down on my knees and said, God, please don't take the Holy Spirit away from me. What do I do now? Uh, what you do now is you go out and prophesy. Um, first, you got it wrong. The un unforgivable, unforgivable sin is not denying the Holy Spirit. It is saying that what is the Holy Spirit is doing is from the devil. It's one of the hardest sins to do because when God moves in, it's undeniable. When he heals, when he delivers, when he sets free, it's undeniable that it's his work. Um, and so you haven't you haven't committed the unforgiven, unforgivable spirit. The, the un, you haven't committed the unfor, unforgivable sin. Now, what it is possible to do is grieve the Holy Spirit, and it's possible to quench the Holy Spirit. So stir up the gift within you. And here's a word just for you, and it's for all of us too at the same time. The gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. He doesn't change his mind. 
what He's given to you, He will never take away. All you have to do is stir it up. We leave you these words from John. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. God bless you. We'll see you again tomorrow.